Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is testicular germ cell tumors. In this video, I will discuss the clinical features and diagnostic tests for testicular germ cell tumors and compare and contrast the various types. Now, testicular cancer is the most common malignancy in males aged 15 to 35 years and accounts for about 1% of cancers in males. Almost all testicular neoplasms arise from germ cells and almost all are malignant. They are typically preceded by germ cell neoplasia in situ. Now, as you'll recall, in situ malignancy can be seen in almost all organ systems, such as ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast and squamous cell carcinoma in situ of the cervix. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that even though we're going to be subtyping these various germ cell tumors, metastatic foci may be a different subtype from the primary tumor. Most testicular germ cell tumors will present as a painless testicular mass that does not transilluminate. This is in contradistinction to a hydrocele that will transilluminate, and I'll show you an image of that in the next slide. However, about 10% of cases will present due to manifestations of metastasis, such as lymphadenopathy, cough, anorexia, or back pain due to skeletal metastases. Now, in a patient who has a painless testicular mass, the appropriate diagnostic test is not biopsy because we assume that this tumor is most likely malignant and because of the risk that we will seed our biopsy tract with tumor cells. Therefore, the diagnostic procedure, which is also curative in many cases, is radical orchiectomy. We can also use laboratory tests in order to subtype the tumor. Here's an example of transillumination of a hydrocele. You can see here that light shines through this fluid, whereas if this were a neoplasm, there would be no transillumination. Now, there are multiple risk factors for germ cell uh, tumors. The first of these to consider is cryptorchid testis. Now, interestingly, the uh, risk of uh, malignancy is increased not only in the undescended, but also in the contralateral descended testis. So you need to um, keep an eye on your patients who have a history of crypt organ testis. In addition, family history is a known risk factor, so if there's one member of the family who has a history of testicular malignancy, you need to keep that in mind for other family members as well. Intersex syndromes such as gonadal dysgenesis and androgen insensitivity syndrome are also associated with an increased risk. Now, the pathogenesis of germ cell tumors is not well defined. What we believe happens is that we have a primordial germ cell with an acquired defect of differentiation. We get an activated um, mutation in the KIT receptor tyrosine kinase that leads to proliferation. Now, as already mentioned, we can have a germ cell neoplasia in situ, which is our precursor lesion, and it's associated with about 90% of germ cell tumors of almost all types, and we will typically find this adjacent to a focus of actual germ cell malignancy. It's thought that germ cell neoplasia in situ may arise in utero and remain dormant until we get a hormone surge at puberty. Another uh, factor that is important in the pathogenesis, though not well understood, is reduplication of the short arm of chromosome 12 through isochromosome 12p, and this too is found in nearly all germ cell tumors, regardless of type. Now, seminomas account for about half of germ cell tumors, and non-seminomatous tumors account for another half. Seminomas tend to be indolent and can remain confined to the testis for a long time, and in fact may reach a very large size before diagnosis. When they do metastasize, they tend to metastasize to iliac and paraaortic lymph nodes, and it is only with late disease that we see hematogenous dissemination. They tend to present at an average age of about 40 years, which is about a decade later than what we see for our non-seminomatous tumors. Now, our non-seminomatous tumors include multiple types, such as embryonal, yolk sac, choriocarcinoma, and teratoma. And non-seminomatous also includes our mixed tumors, in which we can have a variety of different types. Mixed tumors account for about a third of all germ cell tumors and are subsumed in the non-seminomatous type. And these mixed tumors can have both seminomatous in about 20% of cases and non-seminomatous components. Now, the difference between non-seminomatous and seminomatous tumors is that the non-seminomatous tumors tend to have early lymphatic and hematogenous metastasis, typically to the liver and lungs. And as I've already mentioned, the metastatic foci may differ from the primary tumor. Now, we have to talk about tumor markers in germ cell tumors because they can be useful not only for diagnosis, but also in following response to therapy. 
The two that we will look at are human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, and alpha-fetoprotein, or AFP. HCG is markedly elevated in choriocarcinoma and can also be elevated in embryonal carcinoma and in seminomas that have a syncytiotrophoblastic component. By contrast, alpha-fetoprotein is seen in yolk sac tumors as well as in mixed tumors with a yolk sac component. We will not see this if there is no yolk sac tumor. So let's begin by talking about seminomas. So as I mentioned, these can be bulky masses up to 10 times the size of the healthy testis. This is because they are indolent tumors. And this indolence is reflected in the fact that the tunica albuginea is typically not penetrated. On cut section, we will see a homogeneous, tan-white, lobulated cut surface that lacks hemorrhage and necrosis. Microscopically, there's a very characteristic appearance of nests of uniform cells separated by delicate fibrous septa. There's a characteristic lymphocytic infiltrate, and the cells are round to polygonal with distinct cell membranes and clear to pale cytoplasm with a large central nucleus that has been likened to a fried egg. Now, what we see morphologically is identical to what we see in an ovarian tumor called a dysgerminoma. And as you proceed through your education, you will learn that we have ovarian tumors that correspond to the same tumors we see in the testis. This is the one where we have a different term. We do not call it a seminoma in the ovary. Now, about 15% of seminomas will have syncytiotrophoblasts, which can lead to a mild increase in human chorionic gonadotropin. Here we can see the cut surface of a classic seminoma with healthy testis here. You can see it's a lobulated tan white uh, tumor that is bulging from the cut surface, and we don't see areas of hemorrhage or necrosis. Here is a classic uh, low power view of seminoma where you can see these delicate fibrous septa and these clear cells with central nucleoli. And even at this power, you can appreciate these small round lymphocytes that are infiltrating through. We'll see them better on higher power here, where you can see this fried egg appearance as well as these lymphocytes. Now, this is a very classic appearance, uh, and you should be able to recognize this uh, in uh, most medical schools uh, and on your board exams. What you can see next is going to be embryonal carcinoma, which accounts for about 2% of testicular germ cell tumors and is frequently involved in mixed tumors. Now, unlike seminoma, which is uh, quite indolent, uh, embryonal carcinoma is locally aggressive and can invade the tunica albuginea to the epididymis and spermatic cord. There's a variegated appearance due to abundant hemorrhage and necrosis. Now, there are a variety of architectural patterns, solid, papillary, and glandular. These do not correspond with the biologic behavior. And the cells are considered to resemble undifferentiated stem cells, which is why it's called embryonal carcinoma. They're large and epithelioid, pleomorphic with indistinct cell borders, hyperchromatic nuclei with prominent nucleoli, and abundant mitotic figures. Lymphovascular invasion is common. So let's take a look first here at our gross appearance. You can see uh, the spermatic cord and the healthy testis. And here is our focus of embryonal carcinoma. The arrow is indicated in an area of hemorrhage. And you can see that in contrast to seminoma, there's a variegated appearance. This is just one of the morphologic appearances of embryonal carcinoma, where you can see these large cells uh, that have here a slight glandular uh, architecture. Uh, they're mitotic figures. Uh, and there's a fair amount of pleomorphism or variation in size and shape. Now, teratomas are an interesting tumor. We encounter these in the ovary as well. Uh, they show a multi-lineage differentiation, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, we can see them both in adults and in children, and I'll uh, talk a bit more about that on the next slide. In adults, they can be quite large, 5 to 10 centimeters. They tend to be somewhat smaller in children. And because uh, they differentiate down multiple lineages, we get a variety of tissues, which leads to a variegated appearance, which can be solid, cystic, or cartilaginous. Now, microscopically, we'll see uh, differentiated cells and organoid structures, so it can be neural or epithelial or even show thyroid differentiation. And it can either show mature tissue, which resembles adult tissue, or immature tissue that resembles fetal or embry embryonic tissue. Now, very uncommonly, we get a somatic type malignant transformation. So, per, uh, for example, perhaps we have a focus of squamous cell epithelium that will undergo malignant transformation to become a squamous cell carcinoma. 
Now, when we think about uh, prognosis and clinical behavior in teratomas, it's going to be different in the testis to what we see in the ovary. So first I will describe what we see in the testis. Next I will describe the condition for the ovary. So in teratomas, we distinguish them as two groups, prepubertal and postpubertal teratomas. Prepubertal teratomas are typically seen in infants and children, usually less than four years old, and it's second in incidence to yolk sac tumor, which is the most common uh, testicular tumor in this uh, age group. They're typically pure with no other cell types, uh, such as embryonal or uh, choriocarcinoma, and they're not associated with germ cell neoplasia in situ or isochromosome 12p, and they follow a benign course. By contrast, postpubertal teratomas occur in adults, and they're typically mixed, uh, and only about 2 to 3 percent are pure, and they are considered to be malignant. So for teratomas, the way that we distinguish whether it's benign or malignant is based purely on the patient's age. This is different from what we do for ovarian teratomas, where what we look at is the extent of immature tissue. So the patient's age does not matter in ovarian teratomas. We will uh, quantify how much uh, immature tissue we see, and that is what's going to determine whether uh, an ovarian teratoma is benign or malignant. So let's focus now on our testicular teratoma. Here you can see uh, a testicular teratoma with the healthy testis surrounding, and you can immediately appreciate this variegated appearance. Uh, here you can actually see a focus of cartilage. Now in ovarian teratomas, which are most commonly mature, we will see uh, not only cartilage, but we can see hair and uh, sebaceous and squamous uh, detritus from uh, squamous epithelium. We do not typically see that in testicular teratomas teratomas, even if they have mature differentiation. And here you can see a section uh, of a, a testicular teratoma. This is uh, immature cartilage. We have some uh, epithelium here and some stromal cells. Again, if this were an ovarian teratoma, we would be looking at this immature tissue, looking for neuroepithelium to determine uh, malignant risk. That is not important in testicular teratomas. Our next tumor type is yolk sac tumor, and as I've already mentioned, it is the most common malignant testicular tumor in prepubertal children, and it is also associated with secretion of alpha fetoprotein. Now, it is commonly part of mixed germ cell tumors, so about 40%, and we will be able to recognize this because these individuals will have increased uh, AFP. Grossly, this will have a variegated appearance due to hemorrhage, necrosis, and its differentiation is solid, gelatinous, or mucoid uh, tissue. And like embryonal carcinoma, it can have a wide range of appearances. Typically, what is expected of medical students is to be able to recognize Schiller-Duval bodies, uh, because these are associated with yolk sac tumor, whereas this wide range of appearances makes it difficult not only for medical students, but residents and sometimes attending pathologists to recognize yolk sac tumor, which is why we can use AFP as part of our diagnosis. However, I think both the boards and uh, many medical schools will expect you to recognize a Schiller-Duval body. So let's take a look at that. Here you can see it is this glomeruloid structure in the cystic space with a central uh, blood vessel and a typical presentation that you might see uh, in a uh, case vignette or a, a quiz question uh, would be an appearance like this and a history of an elevated AFP in a child under four. That should help you to make the diagnosis of yolk sac tumor. This brings us to our last uh, entity, which is choriocarcinoma. It is the most aggressive and least common of the germ cell tumors. Uh, it tends to have widespread and early metastasis, and as I've mentioned before, human chorionic gonadotropin may be markedly elevated. Now, this tumor uh, typically shows hemorrhage and necrosis, and may be just a small tumor even if the patient has widespread metastases. So why do we see this uh, widespread metastasis in choriocarcinoma? Well, choriocarcinoma is a tumor of syncytiotrophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts, which are uh, cells that we associate with, of course, the placenta. And their role in the placenta is to bury, uh, is, to, is to burrow into blood vessels. So we frequently see vascular invasion that can account for this early metastasis. 
Now, I also want to make a um, differentiation here. When we talk about choriocarcinoma in the testis, we are talking about non-gestational choriocarcinoma. Uh, I have a video on gestational trophoblastic disease in which we talk about gestational choriocarcinoma. In contrast to uh, gestational choriocarcinoma, non-gestational choriocarcinoma, so that of the testis or ovary, uh, tends to have a poor prognosis and does not respond well to chemotherapy. So here we can see uh, the classic histologic appearance of a choriocarcinoma. Uh, it looks very similar to what you would see in a placenta with our syncytia trophoblast here, these multinucleate cells, and then we have areas of cytotrophoblast. You can see there's abundant hemorrhage and also some areas of necrosis. So when we think about therapy and prognosis of germ cell tumors, this is where our differentiation into seminomatous and non-seminomatous tumors uh, becomes useful. So as part of our diagnosis, we've already performed the radical orchiectomy. Uh, then there is the uh, possibility that is therapeutic and that no additional treatment is needed, or radiation and or chemotherapy may be employed. Prognosis is going to depend not only on tumor stage, but histologic type. So seminoma tends to have the best prognosis in part because it is exquisitely radiosensitive and chemosensitive, and also because as an indolent tumor, it usually presents with low stage. Even with non-seminomatous tumors, we can uh, achieve remission in about 90% of cases with aggressive chemotherapy. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to this. Pure embryonocarcinoma is more aggressive than our mixed germ cell tumors and has a worse prognosis. And as I've already mentioned, choriocarcinomas and mixed tumors with a high percentage of choriocarcinoma also have a poor prognosis. So here are your four canonical images of the tumors I've discussed. Uh, you should be able to recognize these, uh, and this will uh, help you to do well uh, in your uh, medical school classes and on your boards. As always, here are some questions. You can go ahead and pause the video and see if you can answer them. And thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you find this useful.